Hi guys, so still not in the workshop, still at home under this uh, virus quarantine. But I have a bit of news on the swirlers for you. So if you remember last time, I told you that we got some 3D printed swirlers this time. So they're produced by a company in Sweden, Digital Metal, and they're produced by Binder Jetting. So in Binder Jetting, you uh, make a very fine sheet of small uh, particles, metal particles, and then you essentially glue them together with a more or less an inkjet printhead. And uh, then you can build up several layers and bind it together with uh, this organic binder. And in the end, you uh, bake out the uh, binder, and then you're left with uh, 316 stainless steel items. And uh, so our swirlers are 316 stainless steel, and uh, they look very nice. So as you can see on the images, they have a, a higher surface roughness than the, uh, than the machine swirlers. So that gave us a bit of consideration about if, uh, if they have uh, as good flow characteristics as the machined ones. So the first thing we did was we put them through a couple of tests to measure the flow rate. And as you can see on, uh, on this chart, then they performed just as well. And actually they seem to have a slightly higher flow rate than the machined ones. And so that can be a bit tricky to explain, but actually if you look at the internal geometry of the swirlers in these two uh, cross sections, in the machined ones you can see we have sharp edges on all the uh, edges inside. Whereas on the 3D printed, all the edges have sort of been uh, rounded out to have more organic shapes. And it's probably that kind of rounding that gives uh, less flow restriction inside the swirlers. So it seems like that these 3D printed swirlers, they actually have slightly better flow characteristics than the machine wants. But that can be a little bit uh, too early to tell for, uh, for now. But so far it's, uh, it's looking really good. So not only did we uh, measure the uh, the flow rates, we also uh, characterized to some extent the uh, the exit uh, cone angles of the flows and also the atomization. So of course, if we were really pros, we would characterize the atomization by uh, fancy laser equipment. But we uh, we just look at uh, some recordings and uh, visually, purely visually, they seem to behave just like the machine wants in uh, regards to atomization. In case you're wondering how we actually perform these flow tests, it's, uh, it's really rather simple. So we have a, a huge water tank uh, that we pressurize to uh, various pressures, typically between two and nine bars. And uh, then we simply measure the flow out of these swirlers. And we do that by uh, having flow meters small turbine flow meters on the test stand. So we measure pressure and flow at the same time. So if you look at the graphs, then you can see around each pressure point, there's a lot of uh, small dots, and those are individual uh, measurements from uh, from flow and, uh, and pressure. And you can see that the uh, the curves, they give this nice uh, square root function. And uh, that is just as you would expect, because the equation that we're working with in this case is that the mass flow rate equals the, uh, the square area of the hole that we are uh, pushing water through, and then times the uh, the discharge coefficient, a dimensional uh, coefficient, and then times square root of two times the uh, density of the liquid times the pressure drop. And so uh, we have this dimensionless coefficient, the discharge coefficient. And one thing we note is that on these swirlers, that is uh, a bit lower than it is for, for instance, a showerhead injector. So for our BPM5 engine, we were working with a showerhead injector. So each small injector hole is essentially a, a hole. And those holes, they all had a discharge coefficient of just a, of about 0 0.8. And uh, on the swirlers, the discharge coefficient is about 0 0.5 to 0 0.55. So it is somewhat lower, but the geometry is also very, very different. Um, you can see on, uh, on a regular uh, injector, like the original BPM5 injector. Once the fluid has exited the small injector hole, then it is free to, to enter the combustion chamber. Whereas on a swirler, the, uh, the hole that adds actually impedes the flow. It sits at the very uh, beginning of the swirler. So after it exits the small hole, then it has to, uh, to go into the swirling element and start to rotate and then come out in the bottom and fan out. So it's a very different situation. So there's a lot more friction loss for a swirler than there is for a normal uh, injector. 
So it is uh, to be expected that the discharge coefficient is somewhat smaller, but I, uh, well, we're a little bit surprised that it was uh, that much smaller. So we will have to, uh, to play a little bit around with the geometry to actually make these swirlers work for our BPM100 engine. So throughout the last couple of months, we have established quite a database on uh, various swirling elements, covering a, a decent span. And um, we also had elements with the various number of holes, so as you can see in some of these uh, illustrations. And uh, so that gives us data that we can ex extrapolate from and uh, that we can use to design the swirling elements for the PPM100 engine, uh, which is really the end goal. Uh, for now, the immediate goal is to uh, get enough elements that we can build a BPM5 engine or BPM5 injector with these. So it requires 19 swirling elements to make a BPM5 injector. And uh, soon we should have uh, enough elements in stock and have them measured out to, uh, to start assembling the first BPM5 injector. So, as I said, the whole exercise of, uh, of this is to acquire data enough to design the BPM100 engine. So, I'm working on a little animation of how the injector of that could look. And uh, so you can see there's, uh, there's quite a few of these elements inside the, uh, the injector of the BPM100 engine. So the whole exercise is really to dimension these rollers such that you can, uh, I mean, fit the uh, right amount and that each element ejects the, uh, the right flow. And so that's uh, an exercise in a bit of a geometry and, uh, and based on these uh, flow measurements that we're doing. So uh, with these swirling elements that we have now, we have them both in brass and in stainless steel. And personally, I think that uh, they will all uh, last in, uh, inside our engine. So, but we'll know a lot more once we have actually hot fired the very first BPM-1, uh, BPM-5 engine with these coaxial swirlers. That is all for now, so as always, thank you for watching and supporting. If you don't want to miss any of our future updates, make sure to subscribe and ring the bell so we can see you next time when we get one step closer to space. Copenhagen Suborbitals is a non-profit all-volunteer project. The reason we are getting so close to reaching space on our speaker rocket is because all of our crowdfunding supporters. If you've been following this project and feel passionate about new ways of exploring space and building rockets, you can help us out by going over to our website, www.compsub.com, and becoming a supporter with a small monthly or one-time donation that helps us pay workshop rent and buy materials. And in return, you get all these insider videos on building a space program which you don't really get anywhere else. So on behalf of everybody at Copenhagen Suborbitals, thank you for your support and we'll see you next time.